On February 18, 1943, Dr. Joseph Goebbels gave his now well-known Total War speech, calling on all Germans to give their all for the war effort in a conflict that had quickly transformed from a triumphal march of German blitzkrieg to a desperate life-or-death struggle. Marianist father Jacob Gopp was not in the midst of that crowd. He wouldn't have heard the speech from his prison cell in Berlin, where he sat for nine long months. While the masses raised their hands shouting, Heil Hitler, father Gopp refused to cooperate with what he saw as unmistakable evil, raising instead the body of Christ at Mass offering his yes to an entirely different leader whose kingdom is not of this world. These were troubled times in Europe. Between 1914 and 1945, well over 100 million Europeans died as a result of political violence. In these dark times, the witness, conviction, and stability of Father Jacob Gopp and seven Spanish Marianists stands out. Witness, conviction, and stability, three cherished Marianist ideals that these men lived to their very limits. What led Jacob to his prison cell? On June 4, 1943, in the notorious People's Court under the infamous Roland Freisler, the seemingly fearless Father Gopp told his story, knowing that few tried in this Nazi court escaped with their lives. Jacob George Gopp, a Catholic cleric, having been warned to tell the truth, declares the following. I'm the youngest of the seven children of Martin Gopp, a factory worker, and his wife Antonia. I volunteered for the Austrian army in 1915 and I was captured on November 6, 1918 in the vicinity of Trent and was taken into Italian captivity, from which I was released to my homeland on August 14, 1919. Gopp, born in Austria in 1897, was 20 years old when he became a prisoner of war. This experience, like any wartime trauma, affected him deeply. By the time he returned home, he had become an atheist and a socialist, an atheist because of the gross injustices he had witnessed in the world, and a socialist because of the crippling inequities, the disparities in wealth that he saw everywhere. He had lost his faith because it had been based only on custom, not on conviction. Superficial faith like this rooted in rituals more than the heart, reminds us of the seed in the parable that when it fell among stones, withered for lack of moisture. Jacob's journey began with a rocky start. Initially I had no intention of becoming a priest, but I was introduced to the Society of Mary by an acquaintance. It was not deep faith but a free education that originally drew Jacob to the Marianist brothers and priests. He was far from perfect, often complaining of too much prayer, and described by his brothers as lacking a practical sense, easily angered, and quick to judge. His saintly seminary superior, 
Father Emile Nubert thought of him as l'enfant terrible, the terrible child. Nevertheless, his less than sparkling beginning was also colored with qualities that would shine in the darkness of World War II. His fellow brothers also characterized him as very zealous and an excellent fellow brother with a strong family spirit. They noted he gladly stands up for others, pointing to his deep conviction which set the course for his life. When studying to become a priest, he said, I will accept only the things I have understood. Indeed, I cannot talk to others about my faith in a persuasive way if it has not first penetrated my heart and really become mine. Once accepted and embraced, however, his faith convictions were like a burning fire, bringing light and also heat wherever he went. I returned to Graz where I worked as a religion teacher in the private secondary school of the Marian Institute. I remained there until 1938. In March 1938, I was transferred to Freistadt, Upper Danube, because I explained to the principal of the school that I could not reconcile with my principles and with my position as an educator the giving of the Hitler salute, which I had already refused in earlier years on the grounds of conscience. When my school principal wanted me to wear a swastika, I explained to him that we, the faculty, and I had already declared our anti-national socialist position to our students and to the public, and that I, therefore, considered myself unable for the reasons of my honor and my conscience to make such a change to national socialism. In 1930s Europe, the future seemed to belong either to Nazism on the extreme right or to Communism on the extreme left. Because Communism was atheistic and Nazis appeared respectful of Christianity, a great deal of Catholics unfortunately concluded that accommodation to Fascism and Nazism might be the lesser of two evils. The realization that Nazism was in no way compatible with the gospel came too late for too many. For many, perhaps, but not all. Early on, Jacob saw through the Nazi facade and spoke courageously against it. His boldness was scandalous to many of his fellow Marianists. To them, Gop's convictions seemed dangerous. At the hands of his own brothers, he paid the price for his witness to the gospel. In 1940, Father Gopp wrote to a friend, I, the imprudent one, got sent to Freistadt where they didn't want me, where they were afraid of my stubbornness, where in general they were prudent like in Graz. I was treated coldly and was forbidden to speak with the scholastics when they asked for an explanation about Nazi socialism. I got pushed into the corner. Father Gopp bore witness to God's truth even when it seemed like foolishness and cost him dearly. On the same matter I was also questioned by the principal of the school in the presence of the previously mentioned young National Socialist teacher. During this questioning I stated that they could send me to Dachau but that I would not give up one bit of my religious principles. I was, and am, of the conviction that my Catholic faith has placed me in opposition to National Socialism. Therefore, on all occasions, including in class, when the conversation turned to National Socialism and its world philosophy, I have in no way concealed my hostility toward it. Twenty years after this interrogation, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. would say, not only that, it's midnight in the moral order. So today we don't talk about the Darwinian survival of the fittest. That was the theory that came along. But for us, it's a philosophy of the survival of the slickest. Everybody is busy trying to obey the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> 
according to this tragic philosophy, it's all right to lie, but just lie with a bit of finesse. There before the people's court, with the fierce gaze and force of the Third Reich upon him, Father Gopp resisted the ethic of midnight. To him, speaking the truth eclipsed personal survival. He would rather go to Dachau, a virtual hell on earth, than deny his conscience. Thirteen times during the interrogation, Jacob openly and boldly expressed his opposition to Nazi socialism. He knew it would cost him, and he did it anyway. In an earlier letter, he wrote, It seems to me that you have to express your convictions as convictions, and not just as probabilities. In a culture where we are bombarded with half-truths, cheap sound bites, and slippery self-justifications, the unflinching witness of Jacob Gopp stands out all the more. When asked about his time in Spain, Father Gopp stated, Because I felt unhappy in Spain, I thought that I might possibly go to England, and therefore turned to the English consulate to request permission to go to England. My application for a visa to England was refused. Three years before Jacob arrived in Spain, fifteen Marianists lost their lives caught in the web of another conflict, the Spanish Civil War. These Marianists were teachers, laboring to form young people in faith. Some brothers were in college when they met the firing squad, armed only with their textbooks as they prepared for final exams. All seven of the martyrs, Carlos Araña, Fidel Fuidio, Jesus Hita, Florencio Arnaith, Sabino Ayeste Erasti, Joaquin Ochoa, and Miguel Labar knew their lives were endangered because they were Marianist brothers. In the midst of the violent storm encircling them, they had a choice, to run or to stay. In the spirit of Marianist stability, they stayed, remaining though it would cost them absolutely everything. Twenty-five-year-old Brother Sabino said, The present situation has brought me to the conviction that what is necessary above all else is a greater sanctity. The persecutions don't daunt me. When just beginning his Marianist vocation, Father Miguel Labar said, Here am I, then, ready for anything. Send me wherever you all want. With the grace of God, and above all, with the protection of His Mother, I will face up to all challenges. Newspapers in Spain compared religion to the mythical many-headed hydra that needs to be destroyed. Because of this, many priests and religious including fifteen Marianists, among them these seven blessed martyrs, lost their lives for staying true to their faith. Far from signaling the end of religion, their blood was the seed of deep faith in others, the kind of faith which consumed Father Jacob Gopp. What moved you to ask the English consulate of all places for news, although England was at war with Germany? I was not satisfied with the reporting of the Spanish newspapers because they were too one-sided. To me, the newspapers portrayed the conditions in the theaters of war as well as other circumstances in a light that made Germany look too good. Among other things, the newspapers reporting was scandalous to me and that these were supposed to be Catholic newspapers, but they never said a word about the persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany. The Spanish newspapers dripped ceremoniously with pious platitudes and conducted themselves as very Catholic, but they did not say one word of indignation about National Socialism's invectives against the Holy See. For these reasons, I went to the English consulate, 
in order to get a presentation of the situation from the other side as well. Did you pass this material on to others to read, and did you speak with others about the contents of the English propaganda materials? Yes, I gave this material to my colleagues in the school to read, and I spoke with them about it. I declare that I often evoked their opposition. They explained to me that they did not want to know anything at all about the English. Didn't you ever stop to think how undignified your behavior as a German must have appeared when your Spanish colleagues conducted themselves, in this case, in a manner friendlier to Germany than you and refused the English news? I distributed the English material among my colleagues in part because I think the religious moment is more important than the national. And I am of the conviction that National Socialist Germany is a mortal enemy of the Catholic Church. Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, says, When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. When Jacob was handed over, he told his Nazi interrogator that the religious is more important than the national reminding us of another passage from the Sermon on the Mount. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whether it was the swastika or the stars and stripes, for Jacob Gop, the cross would overshadow any flag, nation, or patriotic cry. How many people do you know like that? Dr. Karl Ludwig Neuhaus Father Gopp's Nazi interrogator knew only one. Later, as a witness in the process for Father Gopp's beatification, he would say, Gopp's conduct was the most impressive I have ever experienced. Father Gopp made a memorable and extremely strong impression on me, and I could not think of another man who so stimulated me to think about life, its beginning and end, and its meaning. You seldom come across people like Father Gopp, people who live by the principle that we have to obey God more than men. The interrogation was interrupted at 4 o'clock p.m. in the afternoon. The official report reads, The accused has completely admitted the facts of the case as presented above and gave his explanation for his actions that out of religious conviction and for reasons of conscience he could not act otherwise. He was at all times ready to renounce his German fatherland if it would be necessary to remain faithful to his Catholic faith. Jacob would later put his name on the summary record of his interrogation. He curiously signed it, Jacob George Gopp. The middle name, George, does not appear on his baptismal certificate, so why would it appear at this moment? St. George, known for his legendary dragon slaying, became an icon for Jacob at the end of his life. No matter the cost, he was determined to eliminate the evil Nazi dragon. On July 2, 1943, on the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, Jacob was condemned to death. His death sentence read, He is forever without honor. With only hours before his sentence was to be carried out, Jacob wrote two letters. To his family, he wrote, At seven o'clock this evening, I will go to our dear Savior, whom I have always ardently loved. Do not mourn for me. I am completely happy. After such a difficult struggle, I am now at the point in my life where I consider the present day to be the most beautiful of my life. Everything passes, only heaven remains. He also wrote to Father Franz Joseph Jung. Very reverend and dear Father Superior, I renew my vows and offer myself up through the hands of our Heavenly Mother to our dear Lord. I have suffered difficulties, but now I am very happy. I think that I have become holier in this difficult time. Everything passes, only heaven remains. 
In the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed. The word means happy. From the bowels of the Nazi prison, with his end in sight, Jacob talked about how happy he was, the most beautiful day of his life, and how everything passes, only heaven remains. The official document of Father Gopp's execution reads, The condemned, who was calm and composed, let himself be placed without resistance onto the guillotine, at which time the executioner carried out the beheading and then announced that the sentence had been carried out. One remembers the words so often uttered about Jesus during Mass, a death he freely accepted. He went to his death serenely, impressing the very people who would put him to death. The Nazis would not release his body because they did not want Jacob to be revered as a martyr. Only his ring, a sign of his Marianist commitment and stability, and his cassock remain. In the lives and deaths of Jacob Gopp and his Spanish brothers, we get a glimpse into three core Marianist values, witness, conviction, and stability. Witness. Marianists around the world today, lay and religious, women and men, young and old, all share a common mission, to witness, form, and transform. They bear witness to Christ in community, form faith-filled leaders and communities on fire for the gospel, and labor to transform society into God's kingdom of peace and kinship. Blessed's Jacob, Carlos, Fidel, Jesus, Florencio, Sabino, Joaquin, and Miguel bore witness to the end, revealing that in the midst of violence and madness, God's amazing love, which embraces even enemies, is alive and can never be extinguished. The age of martyrs is not yet over. Today, perhaps more than ever, people seek authentic witnesses to love. The word martyr itself means witness. As we witness, our lives may not be threatened, but what about our friendships, reputations, and career aspirations? Where is our treasure? Where is our heart? Do we have the courage to pay whatever price is asked of us? Conviction Marianist founder Blessed William Joseph Chaminade said, We must love what we believe, faith, and especially this faith of the heart is a great gift of God. Jacob Gopp's relentless, passionate pursuit of the truth is a perfect example of conviction, what Marianists call faith of the heart. Faith of the heart goes beyond feelings and has deep, deep roots in a person. If someone has the gift of faith of the heart, their faith becomes the bedrock of who they are. According to Roger Bickelberger, faith of the heart leads to a deep love of the truth, an active dynamism, and a disposition to unite love to conviction. It helps us to love God above everything. It is powerful enough to inspire one to stay in the most challenging situations. Stability the gospel is not only about where your heart is, but where your feet are. Marianists, through their fourth vow of stability, are asked to stand with Mary at the foot of the cross. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, standing beside her, 
he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. The Marianist vow of stability takes its inspiration from this text in John's Gospel. Like the beloved disciple who accepted Mary as his own mother and took her into his own home, Marianists form an alliance or covenant with Mary, promising to labor at her mission of bringing the love of Jesus into the world. This mission ultimately means standing with Mary at the foot of the cross wherever Jesus is crucified today. Stability means staying and standing, even when the stakes are high. It was Marianist stability that inspired the Spanish martyrs to remain, though they could have fled and saved their lives. It was Marianist stability that inspired Jacob Gopp to speak the truth in his Gestapo cell and wherever he went. In Greisinghof, Austria, there is a beautiful monument to Blessed Jacob. There is a huge stone representing the might of the Nazis and the Third Reich that is moving forward, ready to crush anything in its path. And below the stone is a small, thin plaque with the words of Father Gop, he said, Jetzt muss ich bleiben und wenn mir das Ärgste droht. To stay, stand and remain, even when it makes little sense and seems like foolishness in the eyes of the world. Witness, conviction and stability. Three Marianist values lived to their very limits by these blessed martyrs. What do they mean for you today?